morning, Genesis. Good morning. So glad you're here. I was just reading the words up here. I know you guys saw them too. Sing for joy. Let's worship our God because he is our God and we are his people. Oh, that's awesome. That's so awesome. Hey guys, we're going to sing. We're going to worship the Lord this morning. If you can, if you are able, please stand and sing with us. The Lord loves to hear your voice as well. So we've got some words on the screen. If you're not familiar, just follow along. It's going to be great. Holy Spirit. 
Heavenly Father, I want to thank you this morning. Thank you for being our Father. Thank you for being our provider, our protector, our savior, above everything, our best friend. Wow. Thank you so much, Lord, that you would call us your children, that you would look upon us and call us your children. You amaze me, Lord. Father, you, you, you and you alone are holy, and we worship you this morning with our hearts, with our voices, Lord. And as we whisper our own little secret prayers to you, God, we know that you are faithful yeah. and you will hear us, Lord. Yeah. And you will answer. I thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word this morning, Lord. Give us the ears to hear it, the heart to receive it, God, so that we can still walk on this earth and people look us look at us as the, the peculiar people. We don't look like the others because we look like you. Father, this is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, Genesis. If everybody could, can we all just shake hands and love, one, uh, love on one another this morning? Yeah, let's just love on each other, okay? <laughs> good morning. Good morning, y'all. I love you, too. <laughs> Hello. It's so, it's such a beautiful day and it's so nice to see everybody in the house today. Okay, it's so nice to see everybody. Good morning, y'all. My name is Lisa. If you didn't know, my name is Lisa. I'm doing the welcome message today and I'm going to tell you a little, just a little bit about Genesis and what's going on today. Um, so today, Pastor Keith is still taking us through the book of Daniel and we'll be learning how to bounce back when life knocks you down. And also how, that, how the Lord shapes us through suffering. But I, I just wanted to share something really quick before I go any further. Because yesterday, the Lord was speaking with me as I was sitting on my bed. And actually, interestingly enough, I was scrolling Facebook and the Lord was still speaking to me. <laughs> and he kind of had let me pre-know. I had this thought that had come to my mind. Um... It was a question, and it was, how did the disciples die? And then as I was scrolling, this is how the Lord works, I came into this meme, or whatever you want to call it, and it was about how the disciples died, how each and every single one of them had died. Mind you, I had just had this thought, so I know that the Lord wanted to speak to me about this. And... Also, interestingly enough, that is what Pastor is talking about today. Um, so this morning as I got up, someone had put on my heart throughout the week that we ask the Lord what it is that he wants to do and how he wants to move. And so this morning when I got up, I said, God, how do you want to move today? I'm, hu I'm hungry. I know we're hungry for his fire to fall. I know that we are hungry. We are longing for his, his peace to fill us up. We are longing. Um, I, I, I'm, I long for that. I long to see us invigorated by his spirit. And he reminded me, okay, and I'm just going to, I'm just going to go to what exactly it is that I wrote down. That sometimes there's going to be suffering in our walk. And that the Lord can mold us through that. See, his disciples, a lot of them, died a death, an agonizing death. There was one of them that was actually hung upside down. Okay? And he told them to hang him upside down because he said, I'm not worthy to die as the king died. I'm not even worthy to die as he died. So the Lord doesn't promise us that there won't be any suffering. But will we love him with all that we have, even when we're going through trials and tribulations? Will we still love him? 
without condition where we know that he will get us through whatever it is that we're going through. And this is what else I, I, the Lord had led me to write. There was a greater purpose in all of the suffering. I mean, Paul, he preached from chains. Can you imagine what it, would, what it would be like to get up every day and be chained, but still be writing the book to the people and knowing without a doubt, not being able to see it right in front of your face, but knowing without a, date, a doubt that God was going to get the glory through it all. Wow. He was shaping them through the suffering. He shapes us through the suffering. The purpose of the suffering wasn't without a cause. This was a, su this was a suffering, and the, su the suffering that we go through, it'll catapult many, as a, many of us into bringing the sick and the lost into his hand. There's a greater purpose in it. The hand of his salvation, the great hand of being found eternally not guilty in his sight, not ashamed and cleansed of all our unrighteousness. And my prayer this morning was, Lord, take away any disbelief. Take away any apathy that I have for you. Take away any conditions that I have of loving you. And this is where he took me into, into scripture. Take joy in the suffering. Romans 5, 1 through 5. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character, and, can, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. So no matter what you're going through right now, the Lord is going to produce something through that. And so I just feel like the message today is right on time. I, I really do. I feel like there is something here. There's not one single one of us sitting in the house today that came today to hear this message by coincidence. Believe that. The Lord brought us all here for a reason. He has a gift that he wants us to receive. So with that being said, um, I'll share a couple of other things through the welcome message. That was just on my heart to share. Um, and I want to tell... Anybody, if they're new in the house, okay, and you didn't get a bulletin when you walked in, raise your hand, please, and somebody will bring you a bulletin. All right, I don't see any hands raised, so that's good. We all got a bulletin then. Yay! <laughs> okay, so um, you can fill out this bulletin if you're new. There's a connection card in there. It's important to get connected, okay? It's so important, and it's helped me in my walk immensely, and I'll just share that. Um, me getting connected into Genesis has made some major changes in my life, and I've met some beautiful people that I would not have met had I, had I not been brave enough, and the Lord gave me the, the, the courage, okay, to connect, even when I didn't want to, okay? Okay? Um, it, it, it's helped me immensely, and, I, and I, so I share that and say, you know, get here, come, fill this connection card out. Let us get your phone number and your address so we can send you um, text messages about what's going on. If there's anything that you're interested in in the bulletin, check that off, and we can send that to you, and any information on that as well. The phone number that you will text is 740-212-2002. If you don't want to do it the old school way, there's an, a different way to do it, the, the techie way. Um, you can message, um, you can text, let me see here, connect to 740-212-2002. Um, there will be a link that gets sent back to you. You can click into that link, and you can also connect that way. Um, and if you're new, go back to the welcome table afterwards with your connection card or the message that was sent to you, and connect with the people at the welcome um, center, and you'll get a free t-shirt, a free Genesis t-shirt, um, and 
We just thank you for coming today. We just want to love on you. We want to love on each other. Um, and I'm, I'm so ready to hear the message today. I just really think that the Lord is really going to speak through this today. And also, too, there was something that Shane Thacker asked me to share. He says we hadn't shared it in a while. Um, he's doing free music lessons. So if anybody feels led and they feel like they want to, you know, get some free music lessons, um, click up with Shane afterwards and uh, he can set some times and dates up with you, okay? Shane, raise your hand again. Wait, raise it way up high. <laughs> All right. So I think um, that's it for me. Um, I'm, Lord, thank you that you're moving in this place today. We thank you that your message is always on time. Lord, we know you see our hearts. We know, Lord, that you see anything that we may be going through, Father God, and we trust that you're molding us. We trust the process that you're walking us through. We trust that no matter what comes to try to knock us down, your victory will always be there. Your hand will always be there. So we thank you, Jesus. We thank you that your Holy Spirit is resting on us today, opening our eyes and our ears to receive all that it is that uh, you want us to have. And so we just thank you for the gift of your salvation and your love and your mercy and grace. And in your precious holy name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sister. Praise the Lord, everybody. Good morning. It's good to see everyone. Um, my name is Shirlene, and I'm here to just encourage you um, to... Uh, to rather encourage and instruct you on giving this morning. Um, Lisa was talking about scripture and the scripture that I had in my heart this morning was, I beseech you brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. And um, you know, when we think of offering typically we just automatically talk about monies. And of course, that is a very important part of giving because as a ministry, it requires money to function, to have a building, to, uh, add, to give, to share. And so we appreciate that. But more than anything, if we can present our bodies to the Lord, he will be blessed more than anything we can do physically um, sometimes and I'm reminded of the story of the woman who had the two mites when she was giving and Jesus was watching as people gave their offerings and so you know you had those who were wealthy and the Pharisees and the Sadducees who you know they were the chief you know they thought they were elitist and everybody was beneath them and so they came and gave their great offerings and Jesus wasn't impressed you know he really wasn't and that's how God feels when people do things so that other people see them and will recognize them he wasn't impressed but what caught his attention was the widow woman who didn't have very much at all and as a matter of fact, she gave the little she had. That impressed him. Why? Because she gave from a heart of love. And it wasn't about whether or not somebody noticed her doing it. And so this morning, I want to admonish you that to remember, and God has to remind me all the time, and, I, and I'm okay with that, that at the end of the day, I live, I move. I have my being because of him. And if it weren't for the spirit of God, I couldn't do a thing. And I remember um, before Christ, and it's not good memories. And so I realized that I didn't start living. I was breathing before, but it didn't start living until I experienced Christ. So I want to admonish you, don't just give him of the things you have, will you give him you first? Present your body and remember that his will for you is always to bring you to an expected end, to do you good, not evil, and to bring you to an expected end. So 
With that in mind, as you give this morning, there is an envelope in your bulletin. Um, if you would like to use that for cash, um, if you want to use your debit card, you may use your envelope as well because that's where you'll put your information. Just make sure we can read it. Um, and then at the end of the service, you can put it in the container as you're leaving out. Remember, you may also use your telephone by um, just texting the word GIVE to 740-212-2002. You can mail your offering in, or you can go online and give that way as well. Again, I'm always so thankful that Genesis is a church that gives, and so when I'm talking, I'm never feeling like I'm admonishing you to give because you are giving people, and that makes me very happy to know that we're a church who represents our God well because we act like him. We look like him, and that's a good thing, and that's how people will know that God is real because the scripture says we love one another and because we do to others as we would have them do to us. So as you're giving this morning, remember, if you're not going to use your envelope, please just place it back in the container when you're leaving so that we may, if it's clean, if it's not uh, bent and all that stuff, then just drop it in the container as you leave. Can we pray real quick? Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the opportunity always to give back to you, Lord, a portion of what you've given to us, Lord. We set aside that first 10% for you, Lord, just as a reminder of realizing and recognizing everything we have, the ability to work, to do. Lord, we understand that you are the one who provides seed to the sower, and so we don't take it for granted, Lord. We say thank you, Father, by returning to you a portion of what you've given to us. I pray for those, Lord, who might be struggling financially, that you would open doorways, provision, that you would favor them, Lord, and cause them to be blessed above measure, Lord, so that when people see their lives, they would recognize that they are covenant-keeping people who serve a living God. Lord, we ask you to have your way in our lives and bless the remaining part of our service, Lord. Cause our ears to hear and our hearts to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. You'll be faced with difficult situations. There'll be times that you don't believe in your ability to persevere. There'll be times you feel incapable of rising to meet the challenges that face you. You'll be tempted to turn your back and run, but running is never the best option. When you're in the middle of a struggle, the only way out is through. Rather than running away from obstacles or trying to figure out some kind of way around them, go right through them. Brace yourself, steady your nerves, put your head down and tackle whatever you face head on. Well, how are you guys doing today? Can I just say I'm glad y'all didn't decide to go to the walleye tournament on uh, Celebration Up North. We're so glad you're here. And uh, I do think that today God is up to something uh, special. And many times when I'm uh, <clears throat> praying through messages and things, I'm like, Lord, um, you know, I'm working on something. I'm like, I really think so-and-so needs to hear this message. And then so-and-so won't be here. And I don't know if you've ever done that, uh, but, uh, boy, I wish so-and-so was here with me right now to listen to this. And here's what I discovered. Sometimes God will say, but I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you in the middle of this. So, uh, so some of this, I'll just tell you, I feel like the Lord has been really challenging me in last week and this week. And, and we've been in Daniel chapter 4. I think it's, if you have a Bible from the back of the seat there, it's, I think, page 722. Uh, if you have your own Bible, we're going to be in Daniel chapter 4, kind of picking up the second uh, half of this. And we talked last week about how it is God opposes pride. Do you remember that? Uh, pride in any form, really. And it's not because God has a big ego. We said it's because uh, actually God is, is an incredibly humble being. 
Uh, we see that evidenced in Jesus Christ. But he's anti-pride because pride is anti-community. Uh, you can't be proud and be a part of a community. Uh, you can try to pretend like you're in leadership of it, but you're probably controlling it if you're proud. And it's anti-servanthood and it's anti-love. And I'll just tell you right up front, it's anti-Christ. That's the easiest way to say it because Christ is the exact opposite of pride. And so uh, we talked about last week how God over and over takes a big issue with this in Scripture. And uh, he, he talks about God poses the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And it's because we're invited to be a part of a community that's different than the world. Now, we expect the world to walk around all proud and what have you. And, and I told you originally that pride was the original sin. It's where that which all other sins spring from is pride, thinking about me, myself, and I, and not really caring about anybody else uh, around. And so what I told you last week was we're invited to be a part of that community and that we as a church, we need to declare war on pride in our own lives. And I'll just tell you that that is easier said than done. And I gave you a couple of uh, things to kind of challenge you last week and said, uh, you might remember I said, uh, Daniel... um, was an example of the kind of person you need in your life, and I need in my life, who will speak the truth to us and will take the risk of the relationship. In Daniel's case, remember, a risk of literally being roasted in the fire. And you need a Daniel in your life to challenge those blind spots because pride, we said, is the disease that I don't even know I've got. So without somebody else telling me that, without somebody else saying, hey, I see this issue, you may not ever know that it's an issue. And then I encourage you also to be that kind of person. Listen, there are some people in the church world that are incredibly full of pride, and on the outside they look like they've got it all together, and they've got it, you know, they may even have great grandiose ministries. And we said pride for some reason the church goes unchecked many times. Uh, that a preacher could, you know, be out front door smoking a cigarette and everybody would be checking him and, and that's fine and rightly so. But I'm saying that when it comes to the issue of pride, many times we just allow it to go on in the church and we ignore it. And, and I would say to you that we need to be people like Daniel who are willing to take a stand and say, not in a harsh way or an unloving way, Daniel didn't do that like I'm better than you. He said, you know, I care about you, that this is going on. And he was talking to Nebuchadnezzar. And then I encouraged you also last week to um, begin to allow God to interrupt you. Anybody get interrupted this past week? Yeah, yeah. It it happens. And remember I said how we handle those interruptions sometimes is an indication of whether or not we have pride. Because pride says I've got my own agenda, my own thing, and how dare you interrupt me. And so I encourage you to be willing to be interrupted by God. And then I encouraged you last week also to do what Jesus said, to be kind and compassionate, loving to the least of these, the people that other people don't consider, the people that nobody takes time to think about. Now, I don't know how you did with that last week, but Nebuchadnezzar did not have um, a good response to those challenges. And God was really trying to get Nebuchadnezzar's attention And he did it in a very uh, compassionate way, but Nebuchadnezzar didn't, he didn't respond so well to plan A. And so what God does is he comes up with a plan B. And these two approaches, you need to understand, not only does he take these approaches with Nebuchadnezzar, but he takes them with you. He takes them with me. See, almost always he'll try plan A. And plan A is like this. It literally says in the scriptures, come Let us reason together. That's God's invitation to you. Come, let's talk about this. Let's reason together. And it's an invitation to have a conversation. And you need to know this verse was written to a particular group of people who were obstinate, proud, unruly, defiant, and they were people that were called by God's name. They were, if you will, the Christians of the day. And God said, come, come, let's reason together. And that's an amazing statement. If you think about it, God does not have to reason with you and me. I mean, think about that for a minute. If God wants to, he can do whatever he wants, any time he wants, any way he wants. He is what we call omnipotent. He is all-powerful. He can snap his fingers and get exactly what he wants. He doesn't even have to snap. But yet God, who is all-powerful, 
says to you and me, why don't you come and let's reason together? Let's talk about this. Let, 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 let's, let's get into it and have a conversation about this. And he doesn't have to do that. Way. He could just impose his will on us. He could just force us because he's God. But he pays this amazing compliment by treating us like human beings and honoring our freedom of choice. He appeals to our mind and our wills and our desires that we would do the right thing, the good thing. And, and he does this to Nebuchadnezzar. And Ron Wallace, uh, Old Testament scholar, says that, that what he sees in this whole story of Nebuchadnezzar chapter 4 is really what Jesus talks about in the parable of the sower. You remember the parable of the sower Jesus told? There was a sower one about sowing seed. <clears throat> and as he threw it out, it fell on different kinds of ground. And, and what he says here is, the hope is, is that when God throws seed out on us, that it will find good ground. Now, I've been tilling my garden uh, a couple weeks ago, and I went in and retilled a portion of it. I had to retill a portion of it because I planted half, and the other half got hard. And you can't put seed in the hard ground. It's just going to lay on top, right? So, so I went in, and I retilled it up again real nice. And it's so soft, if you step into it, you'll sink that deep. It's, it's, it's crazy. And... And I was thinking, as Ron was talking about this idea of Nebuchadnezzar, I was thinking, you know what God really wants for us is for our souls to be open, our heart to be open to his word, to be receptive of the seed that he's throwing out. Because when our hearts are hard, or we think we got it together and we don't need it under this or whatever, or I don't need to hear that or that's not me or whatever, and then it just kind of bounces off and it doesn't take root. And what God's really doing when he's speaking to us and says, come, let us reason together, he's looking to throw some seed out, and he's hoping that our hearts will be soft and open to that, and that we will be able to receive it. And from that receiving will come now a root that will grow maturity, and eventually the fruit of the Spirit. Now, it's very clear that Nebuchadnezzar <clears throat> is not receptive. He hears, but he doesn't receive. And God is very clear about what Nebuchadnezzar needs to learn. It's not because he's missed the message. Take a look at this, verse 17. It says, The decision announced by messengers, the holy ones, declare the verdict so that the living may know that the Most High is sovereign over all the kingdoms of the earth and gives them to anyone he wishes and sets over them the lowliest of people. Now, in case Nebuchadnezzar missed the message, God does what he often does with us. And in fact, he always does with us. He repeats it again. Look at verse 25. This is Daniel now giving the interpretation of the dream. And so this is a repeat of what God already spoke to him. He says um, in verse 25, You will be driven away from the people. You will live with wild animals who eat the grass of the ox uh, like the ox. You'll be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass away uh, for you until you acknowledge what? You'll acknowledge the most highest sovereign, that he's in control, over all the kingdoms of the earth. And he gives them to anyone he wishes. Now, just in case you missed that, we got a lot of prophets today who don't understand this. They say, well, I spoke a word. Why didn't you listen to me? Because God always gives confirmation. There'll be two or three words that he will give you, and it won't be from the same person repeatedly over and over as much as they like to repeat themselves. So if it's God speaking, he'll always speak in different directions. And what you notice here is God once again says to him here in verse 32, You'll be driven away from the people. You'll live with the wild animals. You'll eat grass like the ox. Seven times will pass away for you until... You acknowledge the Most High is sovereign over all the kingdoms and gives them to anyone he wishes. He can't miss this message, right? It's pretty clear. This is not some obscure point of trivia that he may not get on the test. This is an open book test, and it's pretty simple. Acknowledge God's the Most High, and he's the one who's in control and gives what he... He says it again and again and again. It's the only notes he's getting. And now he's put to the test. And... In verse 27, what you see is this explanation from Daniel again pleading with him. Nebuchadnezzar, you've heard this repeatedly. Please, before it's too late, turn around. And in verse 27, he says this, Therefore, your majesty, please accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what's right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. And it may be that your prosperity will continue. It may be. Not that it will, but it may be. What's the determination? It's all based on the soil of Nebuchadnezzar's heart. 
See, whether or not this is going to get worse, and incredibly so, is all dependent on whether he will receive the seed, he will receive the roots, let it grow, and let God deal with him and reason with him. And he needs to become a student of humility and being humble. And so let's see how that goes with him. Is it going to all be well with him? Well, let's look at verse 28. It said, all of this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, As the king was walking on the roof of the palace of Babylon, he said, Is this not the great Babylon I have built as my royal residence? By my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty. So, (laughs) God plants the seed to see if it will bear fruit. Now, notice, how long did God wait? Twelve months. A year. He repeated it to him over and over and over. And then after that seed was cast out, he waits an entire year. So he is so patient. But Nebuchadnezzar wakes up, think about this. Every day for a year, he wakes up trying not to think about how Daniel talked to him. How he was confronted by. He wakes up every day trying to not think about this dream that he had. that was so jarring. He pushes it out of his mind. He tries to keep it out of his thoughts and Every day he says, I'm not going to bend my knee to God today. I'm not going to be paying attention to the oppressed and the poor. Nope, today I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to build my gardens. Beautiful hanging gardens. And they were pretty impressive. Like I said, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And I'm going to build my palace and my walls. And I'm going to spend the money the way I want to. And I don't know, maybe he thinks God is bluffing. Sometimes we think we're getting away with stuff because God is giving us some time. I'll say that again. We think God's not paying attention or it's not that big of a deal because there's some time. You understand that the longer God was patient with Nebuchadnezzar, the more he was thinking, ah, that's not such a big deal. Sometimes we mistake grace for God's amnesia. And God is very gracious, but His grace is a sign. He gives us grace and mercy to help us repent and return. But many times we reject it and we think God's not really paying attention. And I wonder if he told himself, well, maybe I can outsmart God. Maybe he thinks he's clever. Maybe he thinks, one day I'll pay attention to that. One of these days... I'm going to give God obedience, but, but not today. And, and for an entire year, I wonder if he's trying so hard not to think about the dream that he doesn't even want to hang out with Daniel. Just so you know, if you're going to be a Daniel and you speak the truth to someone, they may say, I'm not going to hang out with you. They may block you on Facebook. They, they may. Um, now, I don't advise you checking them on Facebook in a public way. Again, this is about compassion and care, not I'm right, you're wrong kind of a thing. But Daniel has approached him and told him the truth, and I think it's very possible Nebuchadnezzar, every time he saw Daniel, he was reminded, so he didn't want to hang out with him. Can I just tell you something, honestly? One thing that bothers me as a pastor is sometimes when I talk to people about what's going on in their life, and then they don't come back to church anymore. Or they'll go to some other church where they're not confronted by it. As if God's not there too. As if God ain't got some Daniels there. See, you can run, but you can't hide. God's got a lot. Listen, at one point, uh, a prophet was getting upset because he's like, I'm the only prophet. Nobody else is listening to me. And God says, no, no, I've got 7,000 who have not bowed their knee to an... So listen... (laughs) You will learn the same lessons. You may come to Genesis thinking, I didn't need to hear all that. And you hear, oh, I found such a good church. I feel so comfortable here. And then the Lord will send some Daniels to make you uncomfortable. Because there's this issue that's going unchecked in Nebuchadnezzar's life, this issue of pride. And he thinks he doesn't need to fix anything. In fact, he doesn't want to even hear about it. And it's such an issue and grown so far now, for an entire year he continues feeding it instead of listening to what God said. And so therefore, God is have to going to go to plan B. And plan B is going to be much more painful for Nebuchadnezzar. 
If people refuse to listen to God without pain, he will use pain if he has to. Now, you need to hear me. Listen, this is never his first choice. It's never his first choice. Nebuchadnezzar is not the only example of this. Just in, 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 you know, Nebuchadnezzar is such a bad dude. He wasn't really, he was in all this pagan stuff. He wasn't really following. Have you heard about a prophet named Jonah? Jonah he used the same pattern with. He said, Jonah, I want you to go over here to Nineveh, and I want you to do that. And Jonah's like, you know what? I think I don't want to do that. I don't like him, Ninevites. I'm not going to do what you told me to do. I'm going to go in the opposite direction. I'm going to get on a ship, and I'm going to take off. And what does God do? God brings the rain, the storm. Brings problems. Oh, oh, you need to hear me. Sometimes people in the church are praying against devils and don't know it's God allowing the storm. They're standing on a ship like Jonah saying, peace be still. Why can't I do what Jesus did? I don't understand. Because God's in the storm. In fact, God prepared a fish. The storm was not, it was, it was not enough to get him awakened in attention. He, he, he was thrown overboard and a big fish swallowed him. And I can't even imagine the kind of pain that would be. And so God is reaching out through pain. Well, Keith, that's a couple of isolated incidents, and I don't really know if God does that regularly. Have you heard of a guy named Pharaoh? God, in loving fashion, sends Moses to reason with Pharaoh. Pharaoh, let my people go. Let, let them worship me. And he's like, you know, I don't think so. And so God steps up to heat. He brings the flies and the gnats and the frogs and the grasshoppers and then eventually the Nile turns red because they worship the Nile and they think it's God. And, and you understand, he's, he's turning up the heat and every step along the way, instead of Pharaoh responding, what he does is he gets harder in his heart. In fact, at one point, Moses says to Pharaoh, he says, Pharaoh, because it looks like he's getting a little soft, he's starting to relent, he says, Pharaoh, I'm going to let you decide when the frogs leave. And he said, we'll give it another day. I don't know about you, but I've never been in pain where if God said, I'll give, I'll give you a choice to decide when it ends. I'm like, today, please, Jesus, right now, 10 minutes ago, thank you very much for that. But Pharaoh says, no, I'll spend one more night with the frogs. His heart became increasingly hard, and so God raised the temperature of the suffering and the pain and the difficulty because it's his plan B. And I want to pause there for a moment because I wonder if God is trying to sow seed into your life today. Has God been saying to you in some matter, come, let us reason together? And he does this in a gentle way. It, it, it could be that it's just an uneasy conscience that you have every so often that comes up. It could be a friend has told you about a concern that they have for you. It could be that um, you have a Daniel and, that has spoken to you, and maybe you're like Nebuchadnezzar. You just keep blowing it off, blowing it off. It's not that big of a deal or whatever. Or maybe there's some area in your life where you're not letting God be God. Maybe it's a pattern of being deceitful or literally outright lying to people. Maybe it involves sexual misbehavior. But you continue in, thinking God's not paying attention to this. God doesn't pay. Listen, hear me now. Some people, they think they're loving to people because they don't say to them, God's not pleased with what you're doing. So I'm going to be loving and not confront you. That's not loving. You're inviting pain into that person's life. Because God's trying to reason. He's trying to reason through you. Sometimes we ignore those who come to us and we want to reject them. And God's reasoning to us before the pain sets in. He's saying, hey, I want, I want you to reason with me about this subject. And it could be sexual misbehavior. It could be a lack of concern for the poor. And it could be every time you hear a message about it, you just kind of try to put it out of your mind. You try to, try to not think about it. You try to, try to get busy with your gardens. Things to distract you. You try to get to a point where you're like, you know what? I'm just not going to worry about that anymore. I'm going to put that out of my mind. Maybe just one more night with the frogs. And I want to say to you, listen, if you are feeling that uneasiness or you're feeling something like that in your life, don't ignore God. It never goes well when we ignore God. I'm just telling you right up front. I know it may sound like he's challenging you something that's hard, but ignoring him only will make life worse, ultimately. 
And whatever he's talking to you about, it might be a problem that you're like, I don't know if I want to get into that because that looks too hard, that looks too difficult or whatever. It could be that what you don't realize is he's trying to spare you from a lot more. And I would say to you, don't ignore him. It's foolishness because God is not bluffing. He's not bluffing. He's, he's maybe saying to you, you know, I, I want you to deal with this issue. And you're thinking, you know what, God, someday I'll give you my obedience. But delayed obedience is actually disobedience. And I've discovered that God will give you some time to try to reason with you. In fact, look at the way the psalmist writes this. In Psalm 32, 8, he talks about these two approaches. He says, God says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. That's plan A. He wants to instruct you. He wants to teach you. But then he goes on to say, don't be like the horse or mule, which have no understanding, but have to be controlled by a bit and a bridle. You know what that is, right? That's pressure. It's pain. Oh, no, we're not going that way. We're going to go this way. We're going to go this way. I was growing up, my aunt had a horse one time that any time he had a chance, he'd put his head down and eat whatever was in front of him. And he constantly had to just kind of pull his bridle up and direct him the way you wanted him to go. And it was, it was frustrating for the horse and it was frustrating for the rider, let me just tell you. But God's plan A is always, let me instruct you. Let's reason together. Let's talk about this. But there is a plan B. And I would say to you, if God is speaking to you, don't let it get to plan B. Don't let it get to plan B. You need to stop saying no. You need to listen to him. Nebuchadnezzar doesn't do that. He's not willing to become humble. And so through the dream, through Daniel, through constant repetition of the message, Nebuchadnezzar says, no, not me, not today. Today's not the day, maybe later. So he goes to plan B. And plan B is going to involve some drastic measures. Nebuchadnezzar is going to lose his throne. He's going to lose his wealth. He's going to lose community. And he's going to eventually lose his sanity. So he's got a lot to lose with plan B. But he's not willing to listen to plan A. And so God begins to move in him in some ways that involve pressure and some shaping that may be difficult to understand. So what I wanted to do today is I wanted to kind of use a video that illustrates um, what we're talking about today, and then I want to read a passage out of Jeremiah, who was a contemporary of this same day. And I want you to kind of see how God was shaping his people. Let's look at this video. Go ahead, take your house lights down. I went to the potter's house today and found him working in his shop. As the clay spun on the wheel, his hands became intertwined with his creation. But the jar he was making did not turn out as he had hoped, because the clay was unsuitable for his design. So he crushed it back into a lump and started over. I realized that what the potter can make depends on the quality and purity of the clay. So if the clay becomes dry and too hard, it makes it difficult to shape and form. As I stood there watching the potter work, God spoke something to me. He said, Can I not do to you as this potter has done to his clay? Can I not mold and shape you into the design I want? As the clay is in his hands, so are you in my hands. As I thought about what God said, I realized something. What God shapes his people into can depend on our response to his refinement. To truly become the masterpiece God intended, we have to cooperate by letting Him mold us into His design. As I left the potter's house, my prayer was this, Lord, You are the potter. We are the clay. All of us are the work of Your hands. So have Your way in us. Jeremiah 18 is a classic passage that kind of illustrates this picture. And it was written in Daniel's day to the people of Daniel's people. Israel had been disobedient. They refused to listen. They, they weren't willing to hear what God was saying. And the exile, the very reason Daniel is where he is in Babylon, is because the people of Israel would not listen to God when he tried to plan A them. 
And so the fact that they're in Babylon now is plan B for his people. Does that make sense? And Jeremiah 18 says it this way. Jeremiah was a contemporary. This was written in Daniel's day. He said, this is the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah. Go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you my message. Sometimes you look to see. Did you catch that worship team? We just talking about that. You look to see. He says, go down to the potter's house. I got something to show you. And so he's looking to see what God is going to say. So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me, Can I not do this with you, Israel, as the potter does, declares the Lord. Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand. Now don't mess this. Who who does the clay stand for? Us. Who's the potter? God. God is the one that's doing the shaping. God is the one that's, that's working. Now I don't know if you know this about me, but I have a lot of experience in working the clay. I do. I've been, I've been doing it for a long time. See, I, um, I had kids, so I bought these colored clays. They're called Play-Doh. I don't know if you've ever tried to make something out of Play-Doh. Now I've got grandkids. We're working, well, I'm working the Play-Doh again. Okay, it's Play-Doh. It's not clay. But I'm working the Play-Doh, and I remember that sometimes as I'm creating something out of the Play-Doh, it rarely comes out exactly the way I want it to. I, I'm not a master Platoist, I guess you would call it. <laughs> and this text is about God working and the clay not turning out the way he wants it to. That it's not turning out right. See, there gets to be a point, as I understand it, in the clay that you can shape it. And you saw that beautiful vase he was bringing up and how gorgeous it was going to be. There can be sometimes when there is a piece in the clay or a hardening or, a, or an issue that it's not soft and pliable. And there is no way that you can touch it a little bit here or touch it a little bit there. You can't go gentle with it anymore. So you know what the potter does? Smashes it down. Pushes it down. Presses it together with a lot of force and molds it around again. Maybe adds some more water into it. Slams it on the wheel and starts over. And this is a pattern that God does with us sometimes. If you've ever um, had to raise kids, you know this dynamic. You ever try to reason? Come, let us reason together. Try reasoning with a three-year-old sometime. (laughs) You can reason some, right? Like, don't, don't hit your sister. That's going to potentially cause physical harm and maybe mental harm and years of therapy for her later. Don't, don't hit your sister. Don't do that. But three-year-olds don't often respond to reason because they are immature. Sometimes we don't respond because we're immature. There's a piece that needs developed. And so three-year-olds don't respond, so you know what you got to do? you got to get some plan Bs. That's why you have things like timeout chairs and taking away privileges and maybe applying a little pressure to the backside that's extra padded. Oh, I know that's not a popular message, but it's biblical. I'm not talking about abuse, I'm talking about correction. And a truly loving parent knows that sometimes you got to go with plan B. And you don't want to necessarily. You ever hear that story when he's growing up? This hurts me more than it does you. And you're thinking as a kid, you got to be kidding me. But it does. See, if you spend a little time on the potter's wheel, you're going to know the pressure that we're talking about. Hebrews 12, just in case you think this is Old Testament isolated. No, no, this is New Testament. By the way, that's the way you know when things are reinforced from the Old Testament as you find them in the New Testament. Some people ask, "Why why can I eat shrimp but not this and that? We just look for what's repeated in the New Testament, okay? The writer says, My son, don't make light of the Lord's discipline, and don't lose heart when he rebukes you. Sometimes we want to give up and quit. Because the Lord disciplines the one he loves. That means if you're getting disciplined, you're getting shaped, that means you're in the hands of the potter. It means you're one of his kids. And we get get discouraged. We get like, oh, he's crushing me. He must not like me. No, he's shaping you. He says, don't get discouraged because he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. For what children are not disciplined by their father? I'd say the ones that the parents don't care about. The ones that the parents don't care about, they just let them run wild. 
They don't give them any discipline, any correction whatsoever, right? And so what you need to understand is discipline, in fact, King James says no discipline is pleasant at the present time. Um, Discipline is not pleasant experience. You should not feel better after disciplining your child than you did before. It's not a pleasant experience for the child. It's not a pleasant experience for the clay. And it's not an experience, it's, it's not an experience that's pleasant for the potter. They don't enjoy it. But if you're going to shape a life, it's hard work. In fact, I know some parents that won't be consistent in their discipline because it's just easier not to. So it's just easier. See, listen, I know this growing up. It was harder on me and Kathy to say to our daughter, you can't have that cell phone for the next month. You know why? Because we can't just text her and see what's going on with her and where she's at. And she needs a ride. Now she's got to go hunt down a ride. You understand? It creates more difficulty for us than it does them. So you're going to ground that child. You're going to have to listen to some whining. You're going to put them in a timeout chair. They're going to fuss and fidget. And eventually, if you just get exasperated with the process, and you got to, well, okay, just get up then. See, if you really love a child, and you really love that person, you will be willing to let it cost you something. And a lot of people say, well, I'll just lower my standards. It doesn't have to be that high. You know, sometimes the potter is not gentle with the clay. And I just wonder if the clay had feelings, what would it feel when the potter goes, oh, nope, there's a hard place. Mm. Yeah. Do you ever think maybe the clay would say, oh, why are you doing this? Why don't you just lower your standards? You know, do I really need that shaping process? Do I really need to have these kind of high standards. Why can't I just be like every other vessel? And you know what? And it don't matter if you're dealing with Play-Doh in an ashtray. But for a vessel that matters, when I made Play-Doh, I'd get it, and it, it, sometimes it would, you ever, you ever, you understand, you ever been a Play-Dohist? You're working a Play-Doh, and then sometimes you get in a perfect shape and it'll just crack. It don't matter. It ain't worth nothing. It's Play-Doh. You follow me? But, but if you're working with a masterpiece, if you're working with something that really is high value and you care about it and you really want it to be the best it can be, then it matters. The potter doesn't lower his standards when he's a master craftsman. See, if it's going to be a work of art, it matters. And you might be on a potter's wheel right now. God may be shaping you, and it may feel like it hurts, and you're tempted to pray, God, could you just lower your standards a little bit? Do I really need to deal with this? Because it's, it's painful to me, and I don't want to really handle this right now. And can I just give you some encouragement? If you're on a potter's wheel, you are in the hands of a master craftsman who loves you more than you could possibly even imagine. He really does. And I would encourage you not to resist, but to just say, Lord, I'm going to try to cooperate. I I want you to mold me in your hands. Don't ask him to lower his standards, because a great father will never do that. A great artist would never do that. A vessel matters too much. It matters too much. That's the lesson of the potter and clay. And Nebuchadnezzar is on the potter's wheel now. And he walks out on the roof of his palace and he says, again, this great Babylon that I've built for my might, my glory, look at Daniel 4.31. It says, even as these words were on his lips. In other words, God wants him to make a connection with what he just said is in exemplifying the pride and why it is what's about to happen is about to happen. As soon as he spoke these words, he's about to go through some real life humility. Even as the words were on his lips, a voice came from heaven and said, This is what is decreed for you, Nebuchadnezzar. Have you ever been through a time where you've been humbled? And it's painful? But it puts kind of things in perspective. That's what he's about to go through. 
And so in verse 31, it says, your royal authority has been taken from you. You'll be driven away from people. You'll live like the wild animals. You'll eat grain or, or grass like an ox. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge the Most High is sovereign over all the kingdoms of the earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. And immediately what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from the people, and he ate grass like an ox. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. Man, think about that. He was walking in the finest robes in the best palace of the day just a few moments ago. And now all of a sudden, he's living like one of those people he had enslaved. He's no longer able to be proud and think, look how much better I am than these peons around me. He's become one. See, he, he is the guy who made Daniel homeless and brought him into exile into Babylon from a foreign land. He made him homeless. Now he's the homeless one. And it's incredibly humbling. And he's on the potter's wheel now, day after day, moment after moment. And the question is, how long is this going to go on? And the Bible says seven times. And we already saw in ancient times that when the word seven is used, it's a metaphor for a lot or to the most or completeness. The New Testament uses the word teleos. It means to the achieved end. So it's complete. Could be seven years, but you ought to read this as long as it takes you're going to be on the potter's wheel. We don't know how long that is, but the potter knows. The thing I know about God is he has impeccable timing. He knows how long we have to stay on the wheel. And Nebuchadnezzar is going to have to walk through this until he has walked in the shoes of the weak, the uneducated, the poor, the unattractive, the unconnected, the despised, until he learns to see them the way he should have seen them with compassion and concern. And until he comes to the point that all that he's had is not because of his power, his might, his strength, that it's actually been a gift that God has given to him. See, I wish you could hear me today, folks. Listen, God does care if you realize where it all comes from. You don't believe so? Let me tell you something. When I took my kids through McDonald's, and one of them wouldn't share their fries or their whatever with the other one, daddy got mad. Why? Because you didn't earn those fries, kid. I gave them to you, and I expect you to share them with your sister who you love, or vice versa. God cares about how his kids act. And so Nebuchadnezzar here is going to stay on his potter's wheel until he learns about life in the kingdom. Now, if I could fast forward to Jesus' words, here's what he said. Whoever wants to be great among you will be the servant. Whoever wants to be first must be your slave in Matthew 20. What he says is, you don't run this thing like the world runs things. If you really want to be in leadership in a great place and have people look up to you, the way you do that is by serving other people. It's not by position. It's by, well, it is by position, but not look at me, how high I am and how grand I am and the work of my hand. It is actually by your position of taking the place of a servant in front of them. Yeah. And people get this twisted in the church all the time. Yeah. They think great leadership comes with titles. It doesn't come with titles. It comes with placement at the foot of the cross and in front of someone else washing their feet. And Nebuchadnezzar is going to learn this, not just mentally, oh yeah, I know, to be a servant, you've got to wash feet and all that. I get that. No, he's going he's gonna to be on the potter's wheel until he embraces this. Until he's willing to say, I want that. I, and he submits himself to it. Now look at verse 34. This is the turning point. It's the turning point for people that are on the potter's wheel all the time. It says, at the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven. Let me just pause there for a moment. You need to understand, he's not talking about his physical gaze. He hasn't been looking at the ground all this time, and now all of a sudden he looks up. No, what he's trying to say is, this is the position of his heart. Where he used to elevate himself, where he looked down on God, and down on the prophets, and down on everything in the world, he's now realized, no, no, I am here, and now I'm looking up to my only help from where my help comes from. He realizes that his only hope is in God. And so he's saying... I'm going to look finally to the one I've been avoiding my entire life. Finally, I'm looking 
not just with my eyes, but with my entire being, my heart, soul, mind, and strength. I'm, I'm looking to the only person that I can find my hope in. And this is what God's been waiting for. See, when Nebuchadnezzar was on top of the world and he was building incredible gardens and ruling everything, God was not impressed by that. See, he was not impressed. Everybody else was, oh, look at Nebuchadnezzar, and they were telling him what he wanted to hear. God was not impressed. He brought dreams, and he brought the prophet to say, no, 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 you need to get this. You're getting it twisted. You're getting it wrong. God's not impressed by that. But you know when God's impressed? Is now. Now that he's humble. Now he's on his face, and he has to look up to God. And when he realizes, this is my only, this is my best hope, now all of a sudden, God's impressed with that. You want to impress God? Get humble. Get humble and look up for his help. Don't try to solve it all yourself. Help me, Jesus. You have a problem at work? Don't be like, well, I got this. Let me tell you. You have a problem in your marriage? Don't, oh, I got this. I can take I, You know, listen, I'm telling you, if you want God's attention for something, just get humble. The one prayer Jesus answered instantly in the Bible was a three-word prayer. And it wasn't even our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It was, help me, Lord. Why? Because Peter said, I can't walk on waves. Help me, I'm sinking. Jesus instantly took him by the hand and put him back in the boat. What I'm trying to say to you is, listen, guys, humbleness, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. When we get humble, we worry about losing face and people won't respect us. Listen, exactly the opposite happened. When you're proud and walking through life, people know that and they see that. They may smile at you and, yeah, you're such a king and great, wonderful, you got everything. No, at some point, behind your back, they're saying, a jerk. Act like they got it all. No, no. Listen, in fact, if you want to win somebody over, Sometimes just ask for their help. So we don't like to do that because we don't, I don't need your help. You ask for somebody's help. You having a problem with a person at work and there's a little bit of this going on? Just try this sometime. Would you be able to help? Well, they might reject me. They might, but they'll probably respect you that you say, could you help me with this? Because even people oppose the proud, but often are more willing to give grace to the humble. And so Nebuchadnezzar now is broken and he is before God and saying, you know what, whatever you want. And it could be today you're on the potter's wheel. It could be God's been shaping you. I don't know through what processes have been going on. Maybe you messed up in some area of your life really a long time ago and it was really bad. Maybe, maybe you hurt someone. Maybe you cheated in a relationship and you're experiencing brokenness. Maybe the truth is you've been building your own kingdom. Your own kingdom at work, your own kingdom at school. You've been building your own little Babylon, and now suddenly God's adjusting some things, and things are falling apart. Maybe you don't even know why. It is possible, you know, to go through suffering that is not God saying, I'm going to shape you on purpose because you're doing this wrong. Sometimes we're shaped even when we're doing things right by suffering. See, Romans 8, 28, I don't have time to preach on it today. You ought to look it up. But it, it says that God is in the process of shaping even the bad things that happened, even the stuff that wasn't our fault, even the things we're going through, the difficulties and the problems, that he is able to move all of that and shape us with it, that even when somebody is trying to hurt you at work, even when somebody is trying to mess with you and they're tearing you up and they're bullying you and all this kind of, listen, even when that's going on, God is able to turn that twisted evil crap around for your good. If you'll surrender to him while you're on the wheel. That's the key. Will you look up? In verse 34, Nebuchadnezzar says something that shocked me. Because I've been through the wheel sometimes. And one time was quite a long time. And I remember looking back and thinking, all the time that was wasted, if I would have just got on God's plan. And here's what I discovered. Sometimes you can cooperate with God, and you think it should be over here, but he's going to keep on keeping on because he knows when it's the right time. And I remember looking back and saying, look at all that time that was wasted when I didn't. You may do that with a marriage. I mean, look at what happened in that first marriage. And that was all messed up and it was all wasted time. And I get that. But look, look at what Nebuchadnezzar does. In verse 34, he says, at the end of that time, I raised my eyes to heaven. My sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High and I honored and glorified him who lives forever. Now, the interesting thing to this is he does not say, oh, I'll never recover from that humiliation. I'll never recover from what I've lost. He's gone through some crap. He's gone through some suffering. He's gone through some difficulty. But instead of lamenting what he has lost, he's now looking at what he's gained. He's looking at where God has brought him. 
Now, I want to tell you, church, this has taken a mental shift and attitude in me because there are times in my life where I realized I got off track and then I lost a lot of stuff, and I just want to just grieve that. I just want to get stuck there and just, oh, look what happened. But listen, it didn't catch God by surprise. If he puts you on the wheel, whatever it is, it's not lost. It's not lost if you're willing to respond to him. And so let me just say, instead of expressions of regret or despair, do what Nebuchadnezzar does. Turn your eyes to heaven in joy and praise. Why? Because the Father understands and nothing is wasted in the Father's hands. He can use that to shape you. He can use even that which was meant for evil for your good. But you don't know, Keith, I've been through three, four different relationships, five, six different. Listen, God is able to take all of that if you will just yield to him on the Father Potter's wheel. God, I'm going to leave all those years with you. I'm going to put them in your hands. I'm going to trust that you have complete control. And what you'll discover is somehow the years that look like they were wasted that the locusts have eaten (laughs) will be that which God returns to you for good. I'm not talking about you getting this back and that back and this back. No, this ain't about playing a country song backwards. This is about you hearing God say, I've used all of this to shape you. Even your mistakes, even your blowing it, even your messing up, even when you said, I will forever to death do us part, and then you didn't. God is still able if you will yield it to him. Can I pray for you? That'd be all right. The band is coming up, and I want to pray for you. And we're going to take communion together in just a moment after we sing this song to the potter. But I want you to know that today it's not a loss, what you've been through, because nothing is wasted in his hands. God, I want to pray for those who are listening right now who are on the wheel, for those who are experiencing pain and pressure, Lord, that that molding, that shaping that you're doing in them, Lord, that I know is sometimes so difficult to understand. And sometimes, Lord, I realize that it's a chance for us to look at us and blame us and say, boy, I shouldn't have and I wouldn't have. But Lord, I just pray today that instead of criticizing ourselves or getting down on ourselves, we'd look at you, that wonderful potter who is molding us into something beautiful, the way you want us to be. And we just allow you to shape us, Lord, for however long it takes. Whatever seven times means. God, I pray you'd help us to trust you and continue to turn to you, to have a conversation with you, especially when we're hurting, when we're crushed. And Lord, I want to pray that you would help, help us rely on those Daniels that are in our lives, who are willing to tell us the truth and point to our blind spots. Help us do the work, Lord, that needs to be done in our lives, the work that you're doing to prepare us for what you have for us next. And I pray you'd give us this perspective, Lord, that the crushing is not to punish, it's to promote. And Lord, I pray we come back to this passage over and over and over again and realize you're doing a work, a good work, and we need to trust you. Would you help those of us who are particularly hurting as we sing this song to you today about crushing, about pain? Would you join with us? Thank you, Father. In the the crushing, in the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soul I now surrender, you are breaking new ground. So I yield to you and to your careful hand. When I trust you, I don't need to understand. your vessel make me an offering make me whatever you want me to be God 
God, I came here with nothing, but all you have given me, Jesus, bring new wine out of me. In the crushing, in the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soul I now surrender, you are breaking new ground, you are breaking new ground, so make me your vessel, make me an offering. want me to be. God, I came here with nothing, but all you have given me. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Because where there is no Carry your new fire today. There is no wine. There is no power. There is no freedom. The kingdom is here. I lay down my old thing. Carry your new fire today. I realize as we were singing that, some of you are not able to say, I want to be shaped by you, God. And it could be because you're going through some tough stuff and some pain and some problems and you're like, I don't know if I can trust you in the middle of this. I don't know if I want to yield to you on the potter's wheel. I don't even know if I want to be a part of that. And I get that. Listen, hear me. I do. This is why Jesus, when he gathered his disciples together in the upper room, who we heard earlier, every single one of them except one died for their faith. He said, I want you to know how much I love you. And so he not only washed their feet, which he does for us in so many ways, but he took bread, which was a common item in the meal of that day, and then took wine, which was a common thing in that day. And he said, as often as you eat this, which was literally every day, almost every meal, he says, I want you to do this in remembrance of me and my love for you. So we've kind of turned this into a ritual where we take these little cups that are in front of you, if you take that out with me, revealing the bread on the bottom. I'll just go ahead and have you peel the top off which is grape juice. But I want you to be reminded today that Jesus said, you can trust me because this is how much I'm going to show you and demonstrate my love for you. I'm going to the cross for you. And if you've ever been tempted to doubt when you're going through suffering, whether or not he's with you, even if you brought it on yourself, he hasn't left you, he hasn't forsaken you, he's still a part of the process. And he gave us this to be reminded that he's not doing it because he dislikes us or he hates us or he's judging us. Not at all. He's doing this because he loves us enough to go to the cross, to go through suffering for us, with us. And so today as we partake, I invite you to take the bread together. And Jesus said, this is my body which is broken for you as often as you do this. Do it in remembrance of me. Would you partake of the bread together? Thank you, Lord. On that same night, he took the cup, the cup of new wine. He said, as often as you drink this, I want you to drink this in remembrance of me. 
And as you drink it today, I want you to be reminded that this was an example of how much he loves you. Not just those 12 in the room. How much he's with you when you feel like he's forsaken you. How much he, feel, he is with you even when you feel like there's no sense of what's going on. That he's with you even if you've made a mess of things. He's with you right now and all you have to do is receive him. Because the Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And he gave up his blood to forgive even our shortcomings, our pride, our mess ups. And so as you receive this today, know that you can trust him. He won't let you down. He loves you. And if there's correction going on, it's because he loves you. And because you are too important of a vessel to just let it go. He's doing it for your good and he loves you. Would you receive this as a sign of that love today? I'm going to ask if you could, knowing how much he loves you, stand together and sing that one more time with the team up here. And sing it with vigor, knowing he loves you, and you're responding to him in surrender. There is no wine, there is no power, there is no freedom, the kingdom is here, I lay down my own flames to carry your new fire today. Make me your vessel, make me an offering, make me whatever you want me to be. God, I came here with nothing, but all you have given me, Jesus, bring new wine. we just thank you for the message today. Lord Jesus, we thank you that it has fallen on soft ground and we receive it in your precious name, Jesus. And as we go out, as we go out and as we leave throughout the week, help us to remind, be reminded by you that what, through whatever circumstance, whatever situation, that your hand is molding us you are transforming us 
and that you are with us and to keep our eyes fixed on you to allow you to pour into us. Help us to hear you throughout this week in the way that you would ask us to go. And we just ask that your will be done in our lives, Lord Jesus. And in your precious name we pray, amen.